Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. Just ahead on today's episode. Did you hit it off with Michael J. Fox right away? Probably not, because I was friends with Eric Stoltz, who had just gotten fired. Uh I remember being like, he's just a TV star, and I'm a movie star. I was in Jaws 3D. Uh, So I think it took me a while to warm up to him. Tell me some of your directing credits. The biggest job I've ever done was Star Trek Picard. I did two of those. I got to take uh, the starship back in time, which was beautiful and fun kind of to do because it's such a Star Trek thing to go back in time. And the budget was massive, and so that was really cool. Can you put into words how pivotal Back to the Future was to your career? I feel like I had a pretty good career going up to Back to the Future, Um, but it also might be the reason why I never had a great career in my 20s, in my 30s. I never got the career of some of the other actresses that were my age in my 30s and 40s. So much of Hollywood looks back toward the past instead of ahead to the future. How much did your last movie make and what were last night's ratings? Today we are graced to have someone whose career took off by combining the past and future. She has starred in and directed a ridiculous number of films and television shows. Of course, if you travel back to the future, you'll see her in the role that made her a household name as a co-star of one of the biggest movie franchises of the 1980s and beyond. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometka. Join me with today's guest from the iconic film Back to the Future, actor and director, Leah Thompson. If you'd like to be more involved with us at Still Here Hollywood, you definitely can. Just visit patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. You can support us for as little as $3 a month. Then you can see who our upcoming guests will be and submit questions for them. You can even tell us what stars you want us to have on as guests. You'll also get exclusive behind-the-scenes info, pics, video, and more. Again, that's patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. Hi, Leah. Hi, Steve. Fasten your seatbelt. All right. Uh, Where are you from originally? I was born in Rochester, Minnesota, raised in Minneapolis. Do you ever miss it? I do. I do. When I hear someone with a really great accent, it makes me like homesick. <laughs> eh? Um, no, that's a, that's Canadian. Yeah, yeah. They're all alike. No, they're not. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> My sister lived in Minneapolis for a while, and everyone we took her to see um, Fargo, and we're kidding her that she sounded just like the accents in Fargo. I do not. Oh, that's exactly my joke. I to, I talked to a friend once after that, and she was like, oh, I liked it, but no one really talks like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I got the same joke. That's going to be great. Yeah. You know, one of the things I'd like to start off by asking you is uh, about Michael J. Fox. Do you see him at all? I do. I do. Um, a, uh, two or three times a year, I do uh, conventions with him. And uh, so I see him in, in the weirdest situation ever, which is like in front of 3,000 people. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we go out to dinner, uh, the group of us. That's really nice to see him. He's done so much uh, in terms of uh, Parkinson's awareness. Mm-hmm. It's really uh, commendable. He's also raised $2 billion. Wow. So not just awareness, but $2 billion dollars so uh and that's really special to me because both of my brothers were diagnosed with parkinson's Mm. a year ago which is terrifying but um luckily they're older so it's much more difficult when like him when you get it really young but you know what's crazy there's a woman who can smell parkinson's i've heard of dogs no this is a woman in scotland who can smell parkinson's really Yes, that's been proven. And, and so the um, Michael J. Fox Foundation put some money into research for her. I don't, nobody knows how. She has an amazing sense of smell and she can, they can give her t-shirts. They gave her 10 t-shirts of people with Parkinson's, 10 with people without Parkinson's. They cut the t-shirts in half. Not only could she tell which people had Parkinson's, she could tell which t-shirts went together. And then she, they thought she made a mistake on the 10 that didn't have Parkinson's. Because she picked one of them, and they got Parkinson's a year later. It's, it's, it's incredible. That certainly is something that sounds like it needs researching. Yeah, there's a lot of research, actually. There's tons of research on her. It's insane. 
And she, her husband got Parkinson's and she smelled this weird thing. So the thing about her and the way they're studying her is the fact that she can smell it before it has, it's symptomatic. So they're actually trying to find the elements that she's smelling so that they can test people without someone that smells. But she could smell other diseases too. She's amazing. It's, it's a cool story. Have you ever seen those dogs that they profile on Animal Channel or whatever, where uh, if someone's going to have a stroke or a seizure mm -hmm. of some kind, yeah. they go and lay down next to them, mm -hmm. next to the person? Yeah. Panic attacks too. <sighs> There's so much we don't know. Yeah, there is, isn't there? It's beautiful. Did you hit it off with Michael J. Fox right away? Probably not, because I was friends with Eric Stoltz, who had just gotten fired. Uh -huh. I had already done a movie called The Wildlife with him. And so he was a friend of mine. And then I did uh, I did some kind of wonderful um, actor. So I was, pro and I remember specifically being really snooty, because there was a big division between movie stars and TV stars at that point. Still. It's not as much, that's for sure. I mean, you see that Brad Pitt and George Clooney movie coming out and it's really on TV. They say streaming, it's TV. Um, so it's not the same as it was then. So I remember being like, he's just a TV star and I'm a movie star. I was in Jaws 3D. Uh, so I think it took me a while to warm up to him, but he was so funny and so fun to act with because I had done some scenes with Eric already and then had to redo them with Michael. So I could see how they were completely different scenes. Another thing I'd like to ask you about, you probably don't get a lot of questions about, and I hope you're not sensitive. Howard the Duck. I get tons of questions about Howard the oh, Duck do all you? the time. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, uh, it's actually a really interesting thing. I was filling out a form <clears throat> for a press release for a feature that I'm going to do. And uh, they, you know, they wanted like Leah Thompson block, whatever. So I had to put him back to the future. And I was like, oh, my God, it's 40 years ago. And I've been working constantly since then. I've never stopped working. But it's the thing I'm known for. And then the second would be Howard the Duck. And then maybe the third, some kind of wonderful. Then maybe the fourth, Caroline in the City. There's a star right across the street here. Oh, really? It says Leah Thompson, Caroline in the City. Maybe we should have done the interview there. Right there over my star. Um, but Howard the Duck is uh, like a famous flop, which is actually really interesting because it actually made its money back, which is kind of shocking for a flop. And they still keep making DVDs about it. Like there's so many fans for it. Um, and I know this because I go to Comic Cons all over the world, and there's so many people cry about you know how much that movie meant to them and everything. So even though it was a famous flop, uh, no one seems to want to forget about it, including you. So that's awesome. Well, I re just remember I was working here at the time, and there was one famous headline: and a duck, duck cooks. cooks. Frank Price's Goose? Goose, something like yes. that. Yes, boy, we are like the same person. <laughs> yep. Uh, which I thought was very funny at the time, but my God, you put so much work and mm -hmm. preparation into making a film, and then for it to just, it was like leg a legendary flop. So legendary. Everyone has a flop. Like Ishtar. Yes. Oh, I know. One time my husband directed this movie called um, The Great Outdoors, which is also a fan favorite, but um, we were waiting for the first review. I hope it wasn't you. Um, and we were sitting in bed and they came on, I think it was local TV, and they said, if you have the opportunity to see a double feature of Howard the Duck and Ishtar or The Great Outdoors, see the double feature. And Howie and I went like this, oh my God, they got us both. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think Ishtar made its money back. No, I don't think so Howard either. the Duck made like $38 million, which is a lot of money. Yeah, yes, it is. In 1985. Do you remember what kind of an impact it had on you, on your psyche? It was horrible. But in a weird way, it, I mean, because I had the biggest hit and the biggest bomb basically in a year. And so I was devastated. So I had turned down a movie called Some Kind of Wonderful, a John Hughes movie. I had turned it down. And then all these machinations went on. And, and anyway, uh, my husband, Howard the Duck, Howard the Duck, Howard the husband, Howard the Deutsch, Howard the Deutsch was uh, directing it. Then he quit. 
After I turned it down, he quit. They hired Martha Coolidge. Then they fired Martha Coolidge, got Howie back, and Howie fired the actress in my part and asked me to do it. So I never would have done the movie because I'd already turned it down. I'd never done the movie unless Howard the Duck came out because I was like, oh, my God, no one's ever going to hire me again, so I better do this movie. <laughs> and then I married Howie, and we've been married for 36 years, and we have two beautiful daughters. Good so, for you. you know. Good for you. Happily ever after in Hollywood. Yeah, sometimes the bad things end up being the good things. Yeah. Uh, what do you remember about doing Back to the Future? And did you expect it? Did anybody expect it to be the huge hit it was? Well, it was Steven Spielberg. Spoiler alert. A no name. <laughs> and um, Bob Zemeckis, who was a pretty impressive director. Um, and I, it was a great script. I thought it was a great script. Uh, when I read it and um, then when they um, when we were shooting and they shut down or they replaced Eric Stoltz with Michael Fox six weeks in I was like oh they must like what they're doing because nobody does that that's very expensive and so excuse me so um, I had a feeling but we no one knew that it was going to be what it was and they also like got the movie out six weeks after we started shooting I mean after we wrapped Five or six weeks after we wrapped, the movie was in the theaters. So they had That's these. That's fast. Yes, it's very fast. And so they had all these uh, edit bays everywhere, and the, you know, they were pushing really hard because I think I think once they kind of showed the rough cut to an audience, they were like, "Holy mackerel, we've got something. We need it for July Fourth or whenever it open." But what I remember about it is that it was really hard work and. I have the script somewhere in my house. I have to find it. I, I remember looking at it. I did so much work. I, I worked so hard on that part. And, um, you know, everybody always wants to be like, wasn't that fun? You know, that's what people want to hear. And it was very, it, it was a lot of pressure. And it was, a lo it, was, it was scary business, especially after they fired Eric Stoltz. You were like, this is not fun in games. This is big business and a, you know, big deal. So... It was a lot of work. Did you expect your work to be this hard? You mean as an actress? When you got into the business? Um, I, I was a ballet dancer, so then nothing's really harder than that. No. So um, it seemed like a, a cakewalk. Also, I got paid more than $75 a week. So um, I expected it to be hard. It's, a, it's still impressive how hard we work. You know, I'm a director most of the time now, and directing is, it's so stressful and so many long hours and never days off and tell me some of your directing credits i started directing uh movies when i did these hallmark movies called the jane doe mysteries which was like 18 years ago 19 years ago um i made about nine of these movies and they let me direct two of them so my first thing were tv movies i did these two tv movies that i was a star of and that was really cool because they were kind of like indie movies, but you didn't have to try to raise the money. <laughs> so um, I really learned a lot. And then I directed Switched at Birth, which is a show I did for five years for Freeform. Um, and then I directed, the first thing I did without being in it was the Goldbergs. I did like 10 or 12 Goldbergs through the years. Um, eventually they made me act in it. And then I did this other show called Schooled, I did start the biggest job I've ever done was Star Trek Picard. I did two of those. I got to take uh, the starship back in time, which was beautiful and fun kind of to do because it's such a Star Trek thing to go back in time. And the budget was massive. And so that was really cool. Uh, I've done uh, Resident Alien. I'm about to go off to do um, I've done Mom sitcom. Um I've done Young Sheldon. I'm about to go and do uh, Will Trent. I've done Will Trent before. Um, and then I'm going to direct the show that I'm doing right now for the Hallmark, uh, Hallmark Plus, which is called The Chicken Sisters, which just came out. And there's a new show every Thursday on Hallmark Streaming, which is a new thing. But next year, if they pick up the show, which I think they will, I get to direct that too, which is, is fun. I love to direct. I really do. And I've there's the other ones I've done. I can't remember what, but um, different shows that aren't on the air anymore. And I also did my own movie. I directed my own movie called The Year of Spectacular Men, which was fantastic. My daughter, Madeline, she wrote it. She starred in it. She scored it. 
she sang, wrote, produced five of the songs in the movie. And then my other daughter, Zoe, was in it as well. And I was in it and I directed them. So that was like, that's the only thing I've ever done from scratch, you know, where I took an idea and um, I got to make it with my two fantastically talented daughters. It sounds like it. Yeah. And I really, you can still see the movie, The Year of Spectacular Man. It's really hilarious. Because for me, what was really cool about that movie was it was a, a journey uh, written by a 23-year-old woman about a 23-year-old woman. And I realized that all my ingenue work was written by 50-year-old men. And the, I, you know, and what was interesting was some of the reviewers, especially the women, were like, why is she whining? They were like, it was so bitchy. And I was like, you don't remember being, you're, this generation has a really hard time. I can't remember if it's X or Y or G, whatever it is, but that generation is really having a hard time and it's not their fault. It's really not. Is anyone ever surprised or is it already always known before you get there when you arrive on the set and you're the director? Does anybody say, weren't you in Back to the Future? <laughs> I hope by the time that I've hired them to be, or um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's an old movie. Yeah. <laughs> I try not to think of that. Yeah, it's a 40 year anniversary coming up soon. So um, there is the blessing that I, uh, that they aged me forward in it. But yeah, sometimes people don't, don't get it for a while. You know, then they're all of a sudden they're like, oh dear, you really look familiar. I think I look familiar to a lot of people and they might not know who I am. I'm certainly not recognized as much as I used to be. You said you do a lot of Comic Cons? Mm -hmm. Not it, a lot, but three or four a year. In connection with Back to the Future? You know, Comic Cons are weird that way. Sometimes I go to like horror ones or I'll go to a shark one. But for the most part, the <laughs> shark one. For the most part, people want me to sign Back to the Future stuff or uh, Howard the Duck stuff or some kind of wonderful. Um, but yeah, they're. They're an interesting world, and I've, I've been, you know, it's a much more popular world now than it was when I first started. I know. It used to be there was one in San Diego once a year or something, and now they're they're everywhere. Yeah, and they have Christmas cons. They have uh, cons for people who are uh, YouTube cons. They probably have podcast cons. They have... Get on that, Jim. Yeah, exactly. They have, like cons for everything to be honest um and what always surprises me is that um people who just do voiceover are have massive lines people love voiceover cartoon actors and then like i was like at one recently where i didn't have a very good line or you know not and the guy with the line that never ever stopped he did and he he revoiced an, an a Japanese anime character. And I was like, he even just revoiced it. And he's got a line, you know. So it's, I love cons because they're full of iconoclasts. And I, I always felt like, even though people don't think of me that way, I always felt like an iconoclast. Can you put into words how pivotal Back to the Future was to your career? Um, I feel like I had a pretty good career going up to, you know, going up to Back to the Future, um, I was, I'd already done, my first movie was Jaws 3D, which is a big universal movie that made money. And then I did um, All the Right Moves with Tom Cruise and I got good reviews at that. I did Red Dawn, which is also a big cult hit. So I had a pretty good career going, but yeah, Back to the Future is kind of like hyperspace. It was also a great part, but it also might be the reason why I never had a great career in my 20s, in my 30s. I mean, I did Caroline in the City, which was must-see TV and like a 30 share. It was a massive TV show, but I never like played Kevin Costner's wife. I never like kind of got the kind of Kelly Preston or the kind of, um, I never got the career of some of the other actresses that were my age in my 30s and 40s that, um, and it probably, I imagine it's probably because Back to the Future was so big and I was so kind of known for this fantastic part. I, who knows? But I, I, I think it's odd that I never kind of 
you know, that I had to just go into TV and, and never had the other big movie that I might have had. Is there a role that you wish you were up for that you wish you had gotten and, and didn't? So many. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so many. But I don't dwell on that stuff very much because I feel like really lucky. I mean, I really have been working constantly. Um, you know, maybe not with the people, the, you know, the people that I would just adore to work with sometimes. But but I've had a great time and I've had a great career. Um, you know, the one I kind of remember so vividly is Steel Magnolias. I think it was like really, I remember exactly the room and everything. It was kind of down to me and Julia Roberts. And I remember the director saying, she's really from the South. And I was like, I know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay. But you know, she was nominated for Academy Award. I think that would have been, anything like that might have kept me as a movie star for my 30s and 40s. Um, but I'm hoping for the 60s. I'll go okay. Back. We'll be back in a moment. Sometimes when I'm watching the Academy Awards, I think, would I rather be up there as an actress or a director? And I think I'd, I'd really rather be there as a director. What was it like being a member of the Brat Pack? I really wasn't in the Brat Pack, so I say I was Brat Pack adjacent. I wasn't cool enough. I never really wanted to be cool enough, to be honest. I can't handle the pressure of being cool. You built a substantial career. When you reflect on it, what do you go to first in your mind? What is the thing that, you know, really stuck with you? I don't know. I don't know. There's so many great memories and so many great things. But I'm most proud of my movie I did with my kids because it's my kids and it's mine and I made it from scratch. And I scratched my way, you know, making an independent movie, trying to find that money and everything and like, you know, carrying the the props in your car. Like it was uh, and I'm really proud of it. And you're responsible on that kind of a film. Yeah. For everything. You know, you know how I think sometimes when I'm watching the Academy Awards, I think, would I rather be up there as an actress or a director? And I think I'd, I'd really rather be there as a director. Because it's more you, you know what I mean? It's more like everything. And you get to give people orders. There's that. <laughs> Well, I, I, it's 40, 42 years I've, well, I've been performing for 52 years. I've been in the arts for 52 years. I've been making my living as an artist for 45 years, 46 years. So I have a lot of experience, not just as an actor or a director or a producer, but as an artist. I was a ballet dancer, a modern dancer. I'm a singer. I've been on Broadway. I, I have a vast amount of experience. So I can use that, all of that, when I'm directing. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. It's not just bossing around, it's like, it's like being able to help the different people, being able to understand where they're coming from, being able to, all the different departments, really understanding how they, you know, what they need and how to encourage them. And at the end of that, it's your vision. Yes, it's my vision, but also it's a, it's a, actually an ability to be able to appreciate what other people do. Like, it's funny when I'm, I, if I do a show and I'm acting in it and then I direct it, it's a completely different thing. I feel so, uh, so much love for the other actors in a way that I can't as a, as an actor. Like, I, I'm like, oh my God, you're so good. I, I can't, I get it, it's a it's an opportunity to be so much more loving, which I like. I could just be so happy and encouraging to everyone and every department, which feels good. You said you wanted to talk a lot about the Chicken Sisters. Mm -hmm. Talk. Okay. Um, so I just uh, finished this show called The Chicken Sisters, and uh, it's based on a book. Um, that was a bestseller, a Reese uh, book club book. 
and uh, KJ, I, her name is so hard for me to remember. Um, the writer anyway, she's lovely. And I'm bad at names. Anyway, so this show is, I've, I've, like I said, I started directing on the Hallmark Channel, so it kind of feels weirdly like going home because the Hallmark Channel is so women-centric, which is kind of fun. It was kind of the first kind of women TV, and which I've worked a lot in. And uh, anyway, so it's just a lovely show with some really wonderful actors, Wendy Malick, who I've loved and adored forever. So we get to have, have like a lot of cat fights. So it's just a story about two warring chicken restaurants in a southern town. Um, and a reality show comes to to decide which one is the better one. So there are two separate kind of families that are completely intertwined in this little town and how they have to, how secrets come out and um, and how, you know, how they deal with that. And so there's these just beautiful... Skylar Fisk and uh, is is she sissy SpaceX daughter so she of course had the southern thing down and uh, she's she plays my daughter-in-law so we just had a lovely time with these um, uh, Genevieve Angelson is the other so there's four women uh, two younger two older and it was just really fun it's I love doing shows with a lot of women that are lovely we just had the best time and it seemed at first to me like maybe this isn't the right time for like southern women kind of arguing about chicken because of Why the not? kind of political situation that we're in. But then when I did the show, I was like, this is such a great show about community. And I think we all are feeling separated by community, right? Like we're all feeling kind of isolated and like, you know, how do you... I think we all want community. So that's what this show's about. Like, how do you get along with people in this world right now? You know, sometimes uh, I'll talk about it with my brother, who's 14 years older than I am, about how our parents developed a sense of community. And my father was a Baptist minister. And while we, my brother and I, didn't agree with everything he had to say mm -hmm. or what he was preaching, there's something about uh, the community church mm -hmm. that kept people together and provided a support system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, that's what it reminded me of when, when you were talking about it. Uh, how did you and Howard meet? Howard the Deutsch. Howard the Deutsch, he uh, hired me. Uh, first he hired wanted to hire me for some kind of wonderful and then I turned it down and then he hired it to me hired me again after Howard the Duck came out so that exact week and I said yes so I met him on some kind of wonderful which is a lot of people really love that movie and um, um, we didn't start dating until after the show was over he seemed very exotic to me you know because he was like the ruling class and I was the working class um, but we've been together for We've been married for 36 or 35 years. So, yeah, I still love him very much. And today is actually his birthday. No kidding. Yeah. Turning I won't 27. Ask you, it, uh, 27? <laughs> Good for him. It's weird because we You like him young, huh? 35, 35 years. Um, yeah, today's his birthday. And, uh, yeah, we, we have two wonderful kids. My daughter, Zoe, is opening on Broadway very soon in our town. She's playing Emily in our town on Broadway. So really excited for her. Uh, will got, you be there on opening night? We will be there on the actual opening night, but it's in previews right now. So I'm going to go see her in previews first. Will you give her advice? She, 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 try not to. <laughs> She's an amazing actress. She has four movies in the can right now. Um, Juror number something or number eight I don't remember the name it's a Clint Eastwood movie and then she has a movie where she's playing Gene Seberg in the making of Breathless mm -hmm. with Richard Linklater is producing so she had to cut her hair really short she's got yeah. two other movies um so she's got a, she's got an amazing career does she have to speak French she had to do the whole movie in French and she doesn't speak French pretty brave did she have to learn it phonetically I think so. She had like coaches and stuff. Oh. 
the teacher, but uh, the entire other cast was really French. So, but the thing, good thing was that Jean Seberg did not speak perfect French with a very good accent. So she's right in there. She was a beautiful woman. Yeah. Um, how did they decide to follow in your footsteps and your and your husband's? Well, uh, I don't know. Um, it was what they were exposed to. I don't know. You know, there's probably a genetic component um, on my side. My mother was an amazing. She was a, a singer, an actress, a songwriter, a director, a, everything, sculptor, playwright. My mom was amazingly talented. And um, on the other side, my husband's father, he was in the music business all the time. And so they, she gets it everywhere. Grandpas, grandmas on the Chautauqua circuit. And, you know, everybody was performers. So um, I think it's genetic. But I don't know. Zoe wanted to be lots of different things. But I always knew she'd be a great actress because she used to cry when she played um, Barbies. She'd get all involved in the story and tears come in. I was like, what? Um, so she's, uh, and, and Maddie's just got, she's the one that, you know, wrote, starred, scored, you know, she's just has too much talent. Did she go to school for that? She went to music school. Yeah. In New York, she went to music school. She had all these like crazy awards in high school for jazz singing. What I mean you like scatting? Well, that's singing. Yeah. Singing. singing. Yeah. She didn't, no one likes scatting. But all she right. Definitely all right. scat. Yeah, I had to sit through a lot of jazz. Um, but she's a great singer and uh, and a great writer. That's what she's, she's concentrating on right now. We were actually pitching to ABC and NBC yesterday for a show that we're writing together. You are a busy woman. I am very busy. Although, you know, most people say, what has she done since she did Back to the oh. Future? You know how it is. So tell me about your horses. My horses. I could ride my horse here. Um, I have. I just lost one of my horses. He was 34. Wow. How long had you had him? Nordic, 28 years. Oh, that was hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Putting down an animal is no, no bueno, especially when they're that big. He, he just couldn't get up anymore. Like, apparently, they die pretty quickly if they can't get up because their need to stand. Um, so that was really sad. But we have uh, three other horses, and um, they're sweet. They're like, it's so pretty in my bathroom. I can look out in the night, and that's where they like to stand in this one canyon by my house. And I look out, and I see these horses, and it always takes my breath away. I've actually lit them, this kind of great side light, so I can see them standing there. It's like... It's like a some kind of weird dream. What do they do for you? Ultimate lawn ornament. <laughs> My husband loves them. Um, it's very. I could have like fancy cars. I could have like big gardens. I could have Birkin bags, or I could have horses. That's so. I don't know. I have chickens too, and dogs and fish. What kind of dogs? I got two new dogs. They are Belgian Malinois, All right. King Corso, and Pitbull. A strange mix, but they're lovely. And their names are Walter Matthau and Sophia Loren after grumpier old men. Oh. That my husband directed. Walter Matthau, he's got a big nose, and Sophia is just beautiful. I interviewed her for that film. Really? Yes. And I'll never forget. When she walked into the room, the place stopped. And not only that, she was early. Unlike some of us. She was camera ready. Mm. She had a Giorgio Armani suit on. Mm. She walked in and she sat down in the chair and she said, can I have a mirror? And so her assistant gave her a hand mirror. She went like this. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. That was it. That was the total. And she was just, she looked smashing, you know. It was so, uh, such an honor to sit down and talk with her, and everybody was, couldn't believe it. I guess that's really bad that I named my dog after Sophia. No, it's not. 
Um, I, I had a dog named Frankie after Frank Sinatra. Ah, uh, she. I remember going to her house and she just casually had a Picasso in there, and I was like, <laughs> "Casual Picasso, thank you." She probably <laughs> knew him. <laughs> very possibly, very possibly. Uh, he only passed away in the seventies, which to me is not that long ago. Mm. But other people, it might seem a long, long time ago. Tell me, what was it like being a member of the Brat Pack? <sighs> As is in the new movie that Andrew McCarthy put out called Bratz. I really wasn't in the Brat Pack. So I say I was Brat Pack adjacent. So, yeah, I never really made that group. Um, I never made any movies with any of them that are considered to be the Brat Pack. Oh, really? I don't think. Uh, oh, like. Later, I made a movie with Emilio Estevez, which I got an Ace Award nomination. Um, that was called Nightbreaker. Some of those movies are all gone. I don't even think they exist on any form anymore, those TV movies. Um, so, yeah, I, I always felt, like, excluded from the Brad Pack. I'm sorry. That's okay. I wasn't cool enough. Um, I, I never really wanted to be cool enough, to be honest. I can't handle the pressure of being cool. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Mm. But uh, but what is really upsetting is that Andrew did that documentary and he wanted to talk to Howie and I because Howie directed him in Pretty in Pink. So we said we'd talk to him and I was cleaning my kitchen. <clears throat> so I did my interview outside and I had to go. And I said to Howie, whatever you do, do not do it in the kitchen. And I didn't, I should have stuck around. Of course, he did it in the kitchen. And the shot of him is like over the, the entire pantry was out on the island. It's like a snack, like a snack orgasm on my couch, counter across him. And I'm very embarrassed because my kitchen is very clean, usually. There's boxes. And it's insane. Those things happen. I should, my, I, he doesn't think about those things, my husband. You're the director. Oh, well, he's a director, he's a director too. too. <laughs> I take that back. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll be right back. It's a really hard time for Hollywood. It's yeah. a terrible time. Right now? Right now. It just hasn't come back. You were probably mean to me and I never even knew it. Uh, I doubt it. What advice would you give to actors, young actors, hitting it big today? Hitting it big? I don't know. I mean, um... Don't believe what you read on social media? Oh, yeah. Well, you have to take care of yourself. You really do. You, it, they, everybody can wear you down, and, you know, you have to just kind of know who you really are, I think, which is impossible. I still don't know who I am. So I don't know what kind of, I don't have any advice. It's just really hard. My daughter's one of those people. And um, um, my daughter Zoe, uh, I think I think stuff has to roll off your back because it's, it's insane. It's insane, the amount of exposure and. Um, and everybody has a platform now. Yeah, now that there's uh, soon to be all AI everywhere. Um, I, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed and just think it's too scary. And so you don't do anything. So. Do you spend any time on social media? I have, yes, I do. Now, I don't, I post, but I don't usually read what people say back. Then why do you post? Well, it, for business, it's important. It's really important to have a certain amount of followers. And uh, I use I use my platforms in different ways. I use my Twitter in one way. I use my Instagram in another and Facebook in another. Instagram and Facebook are tied because they're kind of owned by the same people. So I use my Instagram and Facebook for one thing, and I use my Twitter for another. What about TikTok? I, I'm, I haven't TikToked it. I like watching TikTok. I, I'm, a, I'm afraid. I know how addictive it is. Even yeah. my husband's addicted to Instagram stories, and he knows nothing about how to run any of that stuff. Yeah. How do the strikes affect you? 
The strikes were hard. Um, but luckily, my, I, I've been really lucky with both my husband and I have been working. I, I did, I just did the Chicken Sisters. And right before that, I did the Spencer Sisters, which was another series I did. I don't know why. If I, I've done four series in my life that have picked up. Caroline in the City, Switched at Birth, the Spencer Sisters, and Chicken Sisters. Like, why? <laughs> so um, my husband and I have been working. And luckily, we took all the work we could. And I was like, why are we working so hard? And then the strike happened. So we've been just really lucky. So my daughter was really funny and really smart. Zoe was like, the strike's not going away. Last year, around the, um, this time, she said, the strike's not going away. We're going on the vacation that we never went on as a family. So we went to Africa and we went on a safari for three weeks. Wow. Which was really fantastic. Just my husband and I and my two daughters. No boys were allowed except for my husband. <laughs> did you have a good time? We did. I mean, it would seem a dumb idea to spend money on a fancy vacation, which was literally the only one we've ever taken, like a super fancy vacation. And it was fantastic. But um, so we were lucky. I was like, we will work again, I hope. <laughs> but it's a really hard time for Hollywood. It's yeah. a terrible time. Right now? Right now. It just hasn't come back. No. I'm really lucky, and my husband's really lucky to be working. And Zoe. Is there any story from the Back to the Future days that you've kept secret all these years and would like to reveal right now? <laughs> no. I don't have, I, I don't even read the books. Like, there's tons of books that tell the story of behind the scenes. And um, I don't read the books. I don't know much. Um, let me think if I can think of anything. I have a terrible memory. It helps me a lot. It's how I've survived. I don't remember. You were probably mean to me, and I never even knew it. Uh, I doubt it. Um, I don't remember How anything. are you going to write a memoir? I should, shouldn't I? Well, you should take notes as you go along. I know. That would be smart. Um, I, I, I certainly have some people that are, like, thankful that I haven't written the memoir. Um, names? No. Because <laughs> um, you can't, you're not good with names. I'm not good with names, but I know people are like, I'm glad you haven't written the book. Um, if I had, to, if I was to write a memoir, I'd have to be really specific for a real purpose, and it would probably be to try to be somewhat inspiring in some way. That's so much pressure. You're right. Okay, maybe it would just be like, I'm mad at all these people and they should know. <laughs> what they did to me. Let me get this That's off my chest. That's the better one, right? That's yeah, the one everybody would buy. Would buy. Uh, and the tabloids would take clips from, take extracts from. I love that quote that, that writers often say is if people wanted you to write well of them, they should have behaved. <laughs> That's a good one. Anything that you'd like to do that you haven't? Anybody you'd like to work with that you haven't? So many people I'd like to work with. So many. I mean, that's the thing that... I mean, I'm super grateful for all the wonderful work I've done and all the years and years and hours I've, I've gotten to act. But when you get to a certain echelon, you, you know, if, you, if I was, uh, I don't know, Diane Lane, if I had Diane Lane's career or something like that, then I'd get to work all the time with, like, the very, very best people. So I have a certain amount of regret about that just because, you know, there's something so magical when you work with someone who's just amazing or directors that are just amazing. Maybe you could be Kevin Costner's wife. Maybe, maybe someday I can be Kevin Costner's wife. Um, uh, so there's, a, there's an endless, but I'm often surprised, you know, sometimes I get to work. I do love the people that I've had to work with even if they're not like the famousest famousest like all the people who've played my daughters and all the millions of daughters that i've had i still am best friends with i really? just love them all the girls from switch at birth the girl that i just was in uh, the spencer sisters with um i call them all the time my my girls will listen to me talking to these people and they'd be like it's so funny you have these friends that are like 30 35 and they're my best friends so I am one of the people that I think my life has has 
unfolded the way it was supposed to. And I've enjoyed it, even if I would have liked to have worked with some other people. Um, I feel like I've done a lot of things. I've got to sing on Broadway. I did cabaret on Broadway, so that was amazing. I'd like to do another play. Um, I'd like to direct a, a great movie, another one. I liked my movie. Did you play Sally Bowles in cabaret? Mm -hmm. No kidding. Yeah. That's a demanding part. It was. It was easy for me to sing for some reason. Singing is a very interesting thing is because sometimes you think you can sing a certain song and you're, you're like, I'll sing that. And you're like, Ugh. and then other songs you just kind of fit in your body. The, all the songs in that show fit my body and they were really, I sang them for eight months. Well, eight people, shows. people were also paying to see you sing. Yes. Yeah. That's a feather in your cap. Yeah. It, singing is so amazing because you can really affect people emotionally so quickly with a great song, you know? Yeah, there's songs that will take me back to a moment in time in my life. Yeah. It just takes three minutes, and a movie will take an hour and a half, you know? So singing is something really spectacular. Thank you for coming in here. I really talked a lot, Steve. I'm appreciative. Because <laughs> I'm not hitting on all cylinders today. <laughs> well, I'm really happy to see you. Oh, thank you. What a nice thing to say. No, I'm I happy am. to see you, too. It's good. And I'm not just saying that because you said it. Well, you know, we're still here, Hollywood. <laughs> That's a perfect ending. Thank you. Thank you. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>